In this video, we're going to show you how to storytell a game of Blood on the Clock Tower using the clocktower.online tool. Before you jump into storytelling, you should have played a lot of games. I would recommend at least 20 games. This lets you understand how the characters work and interact with each other, and will ensure that you're not pausing during the game to check the rulebook. Please make sure you've read the rulebook and also the almanac for the edition that you would like to storytell. I recommend first-time storytellers start storytelling on Trouble Brewing and nothing else. This video will not be going into how to be the best storyteller, it's just going to focus on the tool and how to use it. First, open up a browser, I recommend Chrome, and go to clocktower.online. At the top right, you can see there's a cogwheel. When you click it, there are some sub-menus. The first sub-menu is Grimoire. The second is Live Session, but will be renamed Host as soon as we start hosting. The third one is Players, the fourth one is Characters, and the final one is Health. If you'd like to start hosting and storytelling, you can click the second icon and click this menu item, or press H, as you can see here, on your keyboard. You should create a unique channel number or session ID. This will stop you joining somebody else's game and also stop other people joining your game. I like to use some letters and numbers and then click OK. You can see your session ID is listed over here. You can click the copy player link option and that will copy a URL to your clipboard, which you can then paste or which players can paste and access your session. You can then paste this into the Discord or a private message to your players. Now it's time to add some players. You can use the players menu and click add each time or press A on your keyboard for your players. I've just added 12 players with very unoriginal names. If you've accidentally spelt a player's name wrong, you can click on their name and choose the rename option. Then you'll want to choose the addition. The default edition is Trouble Brewing. You can click on the Characters menu and click on and select Edition or press E on your keyboard. The base three sets are here, Trouble Brewing, Bad Moon Rising, and Sex and Violets. You can also choose Laissez Unfair or load a custom script. So click Custom Script and you can choose one of the popular custom scripts or you can upload your own JSON script. To make your own script, just click on the Script Tool link and have fun creating your own custom script. You can then download the JSON file and upload it into this tool. To go back, just click the back button. Now it's time to choose and assign some characters. Click on the Characters menu and click on Choose and Assign or press C on your keyboard. For a random selection of characters, you can click on Shuffle Characters. You can keep shuffling as much as you like. This is a good example of where the tool isn't perfect in its selection. With the Baron in play and the Drunk in play, the Baron will actually add two additional outsiders. So I need to click this and this and remove two townsfolk. Also, I don't want to show anybody the drunk token, so I'll keep that in the back of my mind. Choose a character that I want to be drunk. And then I'm ready to assign these characters. So I've got 12 tokens selected, even though the numbers don't quite add up. Click assign 12 characters randomly. And then make a note to use these reminder tokens to set the person who is the drunk 
as dr the drug. If you're not happy with how the tokens have been distributed, you can click choose and assign again and choose the same assign 12 characters randomly. Note that any reminder tokens will not be moved. So in the previous example, the virgin was the drunk and now the butler is said to be the drunk, but that's not possible. So I'll just change that token again. You might want to do this if, for example, the empath is sitting next to the imp. Another thing you need to do before you start the game is choose some demon bluffs. So for example, uh, you have this section here, and when you click one of these tokens, it will only show you tokens that are available to be bluffs based on the assigned tokens already. So I might give Mayor, Ravenkeeper, and Slayer as bluffs for the imp. Let's make another setup. Here is an example setup. And let's pretend that <clears throat> this is the these are the characters that I'd like to use this game. Before you start the game, you should also add some reminder tokens to make it easier for yourself. So, for example, some of these players uh, have starting information. <clears throat> so the investigator, if you hover over this token, it shows you the investigator starts knowing one of two players is a particular minion. So let's show the poisoner. I'm adding a reminder token here. It's the poisoner, and the decoy can be the fortune teller, for example. The fortune teller, each night they choose two players and they learn if either is the demon. There is one good player that registers falsely to you. So let's just make the saint uh, the decoy. The washerwoman starts knowing one of two players is a particular townsfolk. So we'll let the monk be seen as the townsfolk and the scarlet woman be seen as the decoy. The librarian starts knowing one of two players is a particular outsider. So let's show the recluse as the outsider and we'll show the imp as the decoy. The chef starts knowing how many pairs of evil players there are, and in this setup, everybody is separated, including the recluse, who re could register as, the, as a minion or demon. So I'm just going to add a custom reminder token of a zero, chef zero. Now this information is the base starting information, but that's before the game begins. So as soon as we go to night one, the poisoner might decide to poison um, one of these characters. So for example, they might poison the washerwoman. I'll add the reminder token here, and now I need to change the washerwoman info, since I decide that it should be false. Actually, let's point to, to Townsfolk. Let's just go decoy, decoy, and better. let's say that uh, the slayer is actually washerwoman sees them as the mayor. If you need to remove a reminder token, just hover over it and click once. All right, let's talk about night order. For the first night, you may, might want to press the N key. Under the help menu, you can see night order sheet or press N on your keyboard. And on the left is the night order for the first night. You should follow this very you should follow this uh, very strictly and then follow the order for the other nights. This is also shown by the blue and the red icons on each token. So blue is the first night as indicated on the left and red is the other nights as indicated on the right. So in this game, we would start with the poisoner, which we did and then we adjusted the washerwoman's information. Then we would move to number two. We would visit the washerwoman, tell them the fake information. Then we would go by number three. We would give the librarian good information. And we would go to number four. We would give the investigator their minion information and decoy. We would visit number five, give the chef info zero. 
And then we will go to number six and ask them to pick two people and give them a result based on whether they pick the demon, the recluse, or the red herring. As soon as you've run out of blue numbers, then you can bring everybody back to the town square uh, and start the game with day one. At the end of the day, everybody will be gathered back to the town square and you will tell them that nominations are now open. Once a player has verbally said who they would like to nominate, you just click the player's name and then click point the finger to the person they are nominating. So for example, it's likely that maybe player six decides to nominate uh, player two. You can adjust the time of the votes. So this is an example of a three second countdown. You will note that it is very, it's painfully slow. If you want it to be slow, that's fine. But if you realize that you haven't adjusted the time from three seconds, you can click reset to reset the count and then adjust that time down to something more reasonable like two or even one second. Before you click countdown, you should mention the number of votes required. So that's the majority as highlighted here. It's the majority of the alive players. Another thing you should check before you start the countdown is to make sure that your players are in their seats. In this example, only player one is sitting down and you can tell that because there is a chair icon to the left of player one's token. Every player needs to be seated in order to put their hand up to vote. In this example, six people have voted. However, uh, player 13 was dead when they voted. So it's important, especially towards the end of the game, to remove any ghost votes that have been spent. Remember, players, once they're dead, only get one ghost vote available for the rest of the game. So to remove that ghost vote, just click the little tick to the right of their icon to remove that. That way they won't be able to vote for the rest of the game. You might want to leave the vote result visible for a couple of seconds, just for everybody to capture that, and then you can click close. Another new feature is that you can click the hosting menu and click nomination history. Every nomination, uh, whether that's an execution or an exile, is logged. So this will make it easy to check uh, whether players have nominated or which players have nominated, both for the storyteller and the players themselves. Once you've given the players enough chances to nominate, vote, the storyteller will need to make a decision on which player is going to be executed. To kill a player, just hover over their token at the top until you see the shroud and then left click once. That player is now dead. You can see the number of alive players goes down and ghost votes are shown here. If you've accidentally re removed the ghost vote when they didn't actually vote, you can just resurrect the player and kill them again and they will, they will gain their ghost vote back. At the end of the day, it's now time for everybody to go to sleep. Another new feature is you can click the grimoire and click switch to night. Switching to night gives a visual indication that it is now nighttime. At nighttime, once again, you will follow the nighttime order. You can press N for the nighttime sheet. Now we're looking at the other night order, so we're going to be following that. In this example, the poisoner is dead. The monk chooses who to protect. The Scarlet Woman doesn't do anything because the imp is still alive. The imp chooses to kill a player. And we are out of red numbers. The fortune teller unfortunately died somehow. Um, so then we'll bring it back to daytime. We will kill the person who died in the night and re remove any redundant reminder tokens. In this example, we have Travis, the bureaucrat, who is a, a good traveler. So I'll just make him good like this. Now, travelers can, some travelers, like the bureaucrat or the thief, 
can affect the voting. So the thief will make a player's vote count negatively, and the bureaucrat will make one person's vote count as three votes. So for example, if the washerwoman has been given the three vote power, when you're running a nomination, you should verbally count the votes as they go around. So let's say librarian nominates the chef. So in this example, when the clock hand passed, we would say one, two, three, and then jump the count to six so that it's clear to the players who has the extra votes or the negative votes. Also note that travelers don't affect the ratio of players. So you'll note that seven townsfolk, two outsiders, two minions, one demon, and one traveler. Uh, that doesn't affect the ratio. So it's a purple traveler. Let's talk about moving players. In this example, let's say that the traveler is run out of time and they're deciding to leave the game. I would not recommend using the remove um, player because that's going to affect everybody's grimoire on their end. All their reminder tokens and their actual tokens will be go mismatched. So it's probably best to just kill that player and remove their vote if they've left for the game and just leave them in the circle rather than actually removing them completely. Some other things you can do with moving players is swapping their seats or moving them in the position on the circle. So for example, if person one needs to move, you can move them like so. And you can see one has been slotted in there. And let's just move them back. If you need two players to swap, you can just choose this swap with that person, and you can see they've swapped out now. After the game has finished, you may want to have another game, for example, with the same players. If that's the case, I, I would click on characters and then click on remove all. You can see all the tokens and the bluffs are removed, all the reminder tokens too. And you might also want to consider shuffling their positions. So you can click on players and choose randomize to randomize the seatings. And now they're not in numerical order per se, uh, and they're sitting next to new neighbors. And you can click that button as many times as you like. If you have any issues with the tool, um, one quick fix is to clear your cache and clear your browsing history, and also try closing Chrome and opening Chrome again after you've cleared your history. Finally, if you need some help, you can click on help and click join the Discord. This will take you to the unofficial Blood on the Clock Tower Discord server. And I would recommend checking out the storytelling channel as well as signing up for one of the Storyteller Baron Ted's roundtables. Ted has a lot of information to share with you, so feel free uh, to sign up to one of those sessions.